and then the master of the academy took me aside he was very sorry but he was compelled to give me back my tuition fee and to ask me to leave the school it wasn't a matter of scholarship i stood well in my classes and did he graduate me into the university he was confident that in that institution i would continue to stand well the trouble was that tongues were gossiping about my case what in four months accomplished two years work it would be a scandal and the universities were becoming severer in their treatment of accredited prep schools he couldn't afford such a scandal therefore i must gracefully depart i did and i paid back the borrowed money and gritted my teeth and started to cram by myself there were three months yet before the university entrance examinations Without laboratories, without coaching, sitting in my bedroom, I proceeded to compress that two years' work into three months and to keep reviewed on the previous year's work. Nineteen hours a day I studied. For three months I kept this pace, only breaking it on several occasions. My body grew weary my mind grew weary but i stayed with it my eyes grew weary and began to twitch but they did not break down perhaps toward the last i got a bit dotty i know that at that time i was confident i had discovered the formula for squaring the circle but i resolutely deferred the working of it out until after the examinations then i would show them came the several days of the examinations during which time i scarcely closed my eyes in sleep devoting every moment to cramming and reviewing and when i turned in my last examination paper i was in full possession of a splendid case of brain fag i didn't want to see a book i didn't want to think or to lay eyes on anybody who was liable to think there was but one prescription for such a condition and i gave it to myself the adventure path i didn't wait to learn the result of my examinations i stowed a roll of blankets and some cold food into a borrowed whitehall boat and set sail out of the oakland estuary i drifted on the last of the early morning ebb caught the first of the flood up bay and raced along with a spanking breeze san pablo bay was smoking and the carquinez straits off the selby smelter were smoking too as i picked up a head and left astern the old landmarks i had first learned with nelson in the unreefed reindeer benicia showed before me i opened the bight of turner's shipyard rounded the solano wharf and surged along abreast of the patch of tools and the clustering fishermen's arks where in the old days i had lived and drunk deep and right here something happened to me the gravity of which i never dreamed for many a long year to come i had had no intention of stopping at benicia the tide favored the wind was fair and howling glorious sailing for a sailor bullhead and army points showed ahead marking the entrance to susan bay which i knew was smoking and yet when i laid eyes on those fishing arks lying in the waterfront tools without debate on the instance i put down my tiller came in on the sheet and headed for the shore on the instant 
out of the profound of my brain fag i knew what i wanted i wanted to drink i wanted to get drunk the call was imperative there was no uncertainty about it more than anything else in the world my frayed and frazzled mind wanted surcease from weariness in the way it knew surcease would come and right here is the point for the first time in my life i consciously deliberately desired to get drunk it was a new a totally different manifestation of john barleycorn's power it was not a body need for alcohol it was a mental desire my overworked and jaded mind wanted to forget and here the point is drawn to its sharpest granted my prodigious brain fag nevertheless had i never drunk in the past the thought would never have entered my mind to get drunk now beginning with physical intolerance for alcohol for years drinking only for the sake of comradeship and because alcohol was everywhere on the adventure path i had now reached the stage where my brain cried out not merely for a drink but for a drunk and had i not been so long used to alcohol my brain would not have so cried out i should have sailed on past bullhead and in the smoking white of susan bay and in the wine of wind that filled my sail and poured through me i should have forgotten my weary brain and rested and refreshed it so i sailed in to shore made all fast and hurried up along the arks charlie le grant fell on my neck his wife lizzie folded me to her capacious breast billy murphy and joe lloyd and all the survivors of the old guard got around me and their arms around me charlie seized the can and started for jorgensen's saloon across the railroad tracks that meant beer i wanted whiskey so i called after him to bring a flask many times that flask journeyed across the railroad tracks and back more old friends of the old free and easy times dropped in fishermen greeks and russians and french they took turns in treating and treated all around in turn again they came and went but i stayed on and drank with all i guzzled i swill i ran the liquor down and joyed as the maggots in my brain and clam came in nelson's partner before me handsome as ever but more reckless half insane burning himself out with whiskey he had just had a quarrel with his partner on the sloop gazelle and knives had been drawn and blows struck and he was bent on maddening the fever of the memory with more whiskey and while we downed it we remembered nelson and that he had stretched out his great shoulders for the last long sleep in this very town of benicia and we went over the memory of him and remembered only the good things of him and sent out the flask to be filled and drank again they wanted me to stay over but through the open door i could see the brave wind on the water and my ears were filled with the roar of it and while i forgot that i had plunged into the books nineteen hours a day for three solid months charlie le grant shifted my outfit 
into a big Columbia River salmon boat. He added charcoal and a fisherman's brazier, a coffee pot and frying pan, and the coffee and the meat, and a black bass fresh from the water that day. They had to help me down the rickety wharf and into the salmon boat. Likewise, they stretched my boom and sprit until the sail set like a board. Some feared to set the sprit, but I insisted, and Charlie had no doubts. He knew me of old, and knew that I could sail as long as I could see. They cast off my painter. I put the tiller up, filled away before it, and with dizzy eyes, checked and steadied the boat on her course and waved farewell the tide had turned and the fierce ebb running in the teeth of a fiercer wind kicked up a stiff upstanding sea susan bay was white with wrath and sea lump but a salmon boat can sail and i knew how to sail a salmon boat so i drove her into it and threw it and across and maundered loud and chanted my disdain for all the books and schools cresting seas filled me a foot or so with water but i laughed at it sloshing about my feet and chanted my disdain for the wind and the water i hailed myself a master of life riding on the back of the unleashed elements and john barleycorn rode with me amid dissertations on mathematics and philosophy and spoutings and quotations i sang all the old songs learned in the days when i went from the cannery to the oyster banks to be a pirate such songs as black lulu flying cloud treat my daughter kindly the boston burglar come all you rambling gambling men i wished i was a little bird shen and doa and ranzo boys ranzo hours afterward in the fires of sunset where the Sacramento and the San Joaquin tumble their mighty floods together, I took the New York cutoff, skimmed across the smooth, landlocked water past Black Diamond, on into the San Joaquin, and on to Antioch, where, somewhat sobered and magnificently hungry, I laid alongside a big potato sloop, that had a familiar rig here were old friends aboard who fried my black bass in olive oil then too there was a meaty fisherman stew delicious with garlic and crusty italian bread without butter and all washed down with pint mugs of thick and heady claret my salmon boat was a soap but in the snug cabin of the sloop dry blankets and a dry bunk were mine and we lay and smoked and yarned of old days while overhead the wind screamed through the rigging and taut halyards drummed against the mast end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three. My cruise in the salmon boat lasted a week, and I returned ready to enter the university. During the week's cruise, I did not drink again. To accomplish this, I was compelled to avoid looking up old friends, for as ever the adventure path was beset with John Barleycorn. I had wanted the drink that first day, and in the days that followed I did not want it. My tired brain had recuperated. I had no moral scruples in the matter. I was not ashamed nor sorry because of that first day's orgy at Benicia, and I thought no more about it, returning gladly to my books and studies. 
long years were to pass ere i looked back upon that day and realized its significance at the time and for a long time afterward i was to think of it only as a frolic but still later in the slough of brain fag and intellectual weariness i was to remember and know the craving for the anodyne that resides in alcohol in the meantime after this one relapse at benicia i went on with my abstemiousness primarily because i didn't want to drink and next i was abstemious because my way led among books and students where no drinking was had i been out on the adventure path i should as a matter of course have been drinking for that is the pity of the adventure path which is one of john barleycorn's favorite stamping grounds i completed the first half of my freshman year and in january of eighteen ninety seven took up my courses for the second half but the pressure from lack of money plus a conviction that the university was not giving me all that i wanted in the time i could spare for it forced me to leave i was not very disappointed for two years i had studied and in those two years what was far more valuable i had done a prodigious amount of reading then too my grammar had improved it is true i had not yet learned that i must say it is i but i no longer was guilty of a double negative in writing though still prone to that error in excited speech i decided immediately to embark on my career i had four preferences first music second poetry third the writing of philosophic economic and political essays and fourth and last and least fiction writing i resolutely cut out music as impossible settled down in my bedroom and tackled my second third and fourth choices simultaneously heavens how i wrote never was there a creative fever such as mine from which the patient escaped fatal results the way i worked was enough to soften my brain and send me to a madhouse i wrote i wrote everything ponderous essays scientific and sociological short stories humorous verse verse of all sorts from triolets and sonnets to blank verse tragedy and elephantine epics in spenserian stanzas on occasion i composed steadily day after day for fifteen hours a day at times i forgot to eat or refused to tear myself away from my passionate outpouring in order to eat and then there was the matter of typewriting my brother-in-law owned a machine which he used in the daytime in the night i was free to use it that machine was a wonder i could weep now as i recollect my wrestlings with it it must have been a first model in the year one of the typewriter era its alphabet was all capitals it was informed with an evil spirit it obeyed no known laws of physics and overthrew the hoary axiom that like things perform to like things produce like results i'll swear that machine never did the same thing in the same way twice again and again it demonstrated that unlike actions produce like results how my back used to ache with it prior to that experience 
my back had been good for every violent strain put upon it in a none too gentle career but that typewriter proved to me that i had a pipe stem for a back also it made me dult my shoulders they ached as with rheumatism after every bout the keys of that machine had to be hit so hard that to one outside the house it sounded like distant thunder or someone breaking up the furniture i had to hit the keys so hard that i strained my first fingers to the elbows while the ends of my fingers were blisters burst and blistered again had it been my machine i'd have operated it with a carpenter's hammer the worst of it was that i was actually typing my manuscripts at the same time i was trying to master that machine it was a feat of physical endurance and a brainstorm combined to type a thousand words and i was composing thousands of words every day which just had to be typed for the waiting editors oh between the writing and the typewriting i was well aweary i had brain and nerve fag and body fag as well and yet the thought of drink never suggested itself i was living too high to stand in need of an anodyne all my waking hours except those with that infernal typewriter were spent in a creative heaven and along with this i had no desire for drink because i still believed in many things in the love of all men and women in the matter of man and women love in fatherhood in human justice in art in the whole host of fond illusions that keep the world turning round but the waiting editors elected to keep on waiting my manuscripts made amazing round-trip records between the pacific and the atlantic it might have been the weirdness of the typewriting that prevented the editors from accepting at least one little offering of mine i don't know and goodness knows the stuff i wrote was as weird as its typing i sold my hard-bought school books for ridiculous sums to second-hand bookmen i borrowed small sums of money wherever i could and suffered my old father to feed me with the meagre returns of his failing strength it didn't last long only a few weeks when i had to surrender and go to work yet i was unaware of any need for the drink anodyne i was not disappointed my career was retarded that was all perhaps i did need further preparation i had learned enough from the books to realize that i had only touched the hem of knowledge's garment i still lived on the heights my waking hours and most of the hours i should have used for sleep were spent with the books chapter twenty four out in the country at the belmont academy i went to work in a small perfectly appointed steam laundry another fellow in myself did all the work from sorting and washing to ironing the white shirts collars and cuffs and the fancy starch of the wives of the professors we worked like tigers especially as summer came on and the academy boys took to the wearing of duck trousers it consumes a dreadful lot of time to iron one pair of duck trousers and there were so many pairs of them we sweated our way through long sizzling weeks at a task that was never done and many a night while the students snored in bed my partner and i'll toiled on under the electric light 
at steam mangle or ironing board. The hours were long, the work was arduous, despite the fact that we became past masters in the art of eliminating waste motion and I was receiving thirty dollars a month and board, a slight increase over my coal shoveling and cannery days, at least to the extent of board, which cost my employer little we ate in the kitchen, but which was to me the equivalent of twenty dollars a month. My robuster strength of added years, my increased skill, and all I had learned from the books were responsible for this increase of twenty dollars. Judging by my rate of development, I might hope before I died to be a night watchman for sixty dollars a month, or a policeman actually receiving a hundred dollars with pickings. So relentlessly did my partner and I spring into our work throughout the week, that by Saturday night we were frazzled wrecks. I found myself in the old familiar work-beast condition, toiling longer hours than the horses toiled, thinking scarcely more frequent thoughts than horses think. The books were closed to me. I had brought a trunkful to the laundry, but found myself unable to read them. I fell asleep the moment I tried to read, and if I did manage to keep my eyes open for several pages, I could not remember the contents of these pages. I gave over attempts on heavy study, such as jurisprudence, political economy, and biology, and tried lighter stuff, such as history. I fell asleep. I tried literature, and fell asleep. And finally, when I fell asleep over lively novels, I gave up. I never succeeded in reading one book in all the time I spent in the laundry. And when Saturday night came and the week's work was over until Monday morning, I knew only one desire besides the desire to sleep, and that was to get drunk. This was the second time in my life that I had heard the unmistakable call of John Barleycorn. The first time it had been because of brain fag. But I had no overworked brain now. On the contrary, all I knew was the dull numbness of a brain that was not worked at all. That was the trouble. My brain had become so alert and eager, so quickened by the wonder of the new world the books had discovered to it, that it now suffered all the misery of stagnancy and inaction. And I, the long-time intimate of John Barleycorn, knew just what he promised me. Maggots of fancy, dreams of power, forgetfulness, anything and everything save whirling washers, revolving mangles, humming centrifugal ringers, and fancy starch and interminable processions of duck trousers moving in steam under my flying iron. And that's it. John Barleycorn makes his appeal to weakness and failure, to weariness and exhaustion. He is the easy way out. And he is lying all the time. He offers false strength to the body, false elevation to the spirit, making things seem what they are not and vastly fairer than what they are. But it must not be forgotten that John Barleycorn is protean. As well as to weakness and exhaustion, does he appeal to too much strength, to superabundant vitality, to the ennui of idleness. He can tuck in his arm the arm of any man in any mood. He can throw the net of his lure over all men. 
he exchanges new lamps for old, the spangles of illusion for the drabs of reality, and in the end cheats all who traffic with him. I didn't get drunk, however, for the simple reason that it was a mile and a half to the nearest saloon, and this in turn was because the call to get drunk was not very loud in my ears. Had it been loud, I would have traveled ten times the distance to win to the saloon. On the other hand, had the saloon been just around the corner, I should have got drunk. As it was, I would sprawl out in the shade on my one day of rest and dally with the Sunday papers. But I was too weary even for their froth. The comic supplement might bring a pallid smile to my face, and then I would fall asleep. Although I did not yield to John Barleycorn while working in the laundry, a certain definite result was produced. I had heard the call, felt the gnaw of desire, yearned for the anodyne. I was being prepared for the stronger desire of later years. And the point is that this development of desire was entirely in my brain. My body did not cry out for alcohol. As always, alcohol was repulsive to my body. When I was bodily weary from shoveling coal, the thought of taking a drink had never flickered into my consciousness. When I was brain-wearied after taking the entrance examinations to the university, I promptly got drunk. At the laundry, I was suffering physical exhaustion again, and physical exhaustion that was not nearly so profound as that of the coal shoveling. But there was a difference. When I went coal shoveling, my mind had not yet awakened. Between that time and the laundry, my mind had found the kingdom of the mind. While shoveling coal, my mind was somnolent. While tolling in the laundry, my mind, informed and eager to do and be, was crucified. And whether I yielded to drink, as at Benicia, or whether I refrained, as at the laundry, in my brain the seeds of desire for alcohol were germinating. Chapter 25 After the laundry, my sister and her husband grubstaked me into the Klondike. It was the first gold rush into that region, the early fall rush of 1897. I was 21 years old and in splendid physical condition. I remember at the end of the 28-mile portage across Chilkoot, from Daya Beach to Lake Linderman, I was packing up with the Indians and out packing many an Indian. The last pack into Linderman was three miles. I back tripped it four times a day and on each forward trip carried 150 pounds. This means that over the worst trails I daily traveled 24 miles twelve of which were under a burden of one hundred and fifty pounds. Yes, I had let career go hang, and was on the adventure path again in quest of fortune. And, of course, on the adventure path I met John Barleycorn. Here were the chesty men again, rovers and adventurers, and while they didn't mind a grub famine, whiskey they could not do without. Whiskey went over the trail, while the flour lay cached and untouched by the trail side. As good fortune would have it, the three men in my party were not drinkers. 
therefore i didn't drink save on rare occasions and disgracefully when with other men in my personal medicine chest was a quart of whiskey i never drew the cork till six months afterward in a lonely camp where without anaesthetics a doctor was compelled to operate on a man the doctor and the patient emptied my bottle between them and then proceeded to the operation back in california a year later recovering from scurvy i found that my father was dead and that i was the head and the sole breadwinner of a household when i state that i had passed coal on a steamship from bering sea to british columbia and travelled in the steerage from there to san francisco it will be understood that i brought nothing back from the klondike but my scurvy times were hard work of any sort was difficult to get and work of any sort was what i had to take for i was still an unskilled laborer i had no thought of career that was over and done with i had to find food for two mouths besides my own and keep a roof over our heads yes and buy a winter suit my one suit being decidedly summery i had to get some sort of work immediately after that when i had caught my breath i might think about my future unskilled labor is the first to feel the slackness of hard times and i had no trades save those of sailor and laundryman with my new responsibilities i didn't care to go to sea and i failed to find a job at laundrying i failed to find a job at anything i had my name down in five employment bureau i advertised in three newspapers i sought out the few friends i knew who might be able to get me work but they were either uninterested or unable to find anything for me the situation was desperate i pawned my watch my bicycle and a mackintosh of which my father had been very proud and which he had left to me it was and is my sole legacy in this world it had cost fifteen dollars and the pawnbroker let me have two dollars on it and oh yes a waterfront comrade of earlier years drifted along one day with a dress suit wrapped in newspapers he could give no adequate explanation of how he had come to possess it nor did i press for an explanation i wanted the suit myself no not to wear i traded him a lot of rubbish which being unpawnable was useless to me he peddled the rubbish for several dollars while i pledged the dress suit with my pawnbroker for five dollars and for all i knew the pawnbroker still has the suit i had never intended to redeem it but i couldn't get any work yet i was a bargain in the labor market i was twenty-two years old weighed one hundred and sixty-five pounds stripped every pound of which was excellent for toil and the last traces of my scurvy were vanishing before a treatment of potatoes chewed raw i tackled every opening for employment i tried to become a studio model but there were too many fine-bodied young fellows out of jobs i answered advertisements of elderly invalids in need of companions and i almost became a sewing machine agent on commission without salary but poor people don't buy sewing machines in hard times so i was forced to forgo that employment of course it must be remembered that along with such frivolous occupations i was trying to get work as wop lumper and roustabout 
But winter was coming on, and the surplus labor army was pouring into the cities. Also I, who had romped along carelessly through the countries of the world and the kingdom of the mind, was not a member of any union. I sought odd jobs. I worked days and half days at anything I could get. I mowed lawns, trimmed hedges, took up carpets, beat them, and laid them again. Further, I took the civil service examinations for mail carrier and passed first. But alas, there was no vacancy and I must wait. And while I waited, and in between the odd jobs I managed to procure, I started to earn ten dollars by writing a newspaper account of a voyage I had made, in an open boat down the Yukon, of nineteen hundred miles in nineteen days. I didn't know the first thing about the newspaper game, but I was confident I'd get ten dollars for my article but i didn't the first san francisco newspaper to which i mailed it never acknowledged receipt of the manuscript but held on to it the longer it held on to it the more certain i was that the thing was accepted but here is the funny thing some are born to fortune and some have fortune thrust upon them but in my case I was clubbed into fortune, and bitter necessity wielded the club. I had long since abandoned all thought of writing as a career. My honest intention in writing that article was to earn ten dollars, and that was the limit of my intention. It would help to tide me along until I got steady employment. Had a vacancy occurred in the post office at that time, I should have jumped at it. But the vacancy did not occur, nor did a steady job, and I employed the time between odd jobs with writing a 21,000-word serial for the youth's companion. I turned it out and typed it in seven days. I fancy that was what was the matter with it, for it came back. It took some time for it to go and come, and in the meantime I tried my hand at short stories. I sold one to the Overland Monthly for five dollars. The Black Cat gave me forty dollars for another. The Overland Monthly offered me seven dollars and a half, pay on publication, for all the stories I should deliver. I got my bicycle, my watch, and my father's Macintosh out of pawn and rented a typewriter. Also, I paid up the bills I owed to the several groceries that allowed me a small credit. I recall the Portuguese grocery man who never permitted my bill to go beyond four dollars. Hopkins, another grocer, could not be budged beyond five dollars and just then came the call from the post office to go to work. It placed me in a most trying predicament. The sixty-five dollars I could earn regularly every month was a terrible temptation. I couldn't decide what to do. And I'll never be able to forgive the postmaster of Oakland. I answered the call, and I talked to him like a man. I frankly told him the situation. It looked as if I might win out at writing. The chance was good, but not certain. Now, if he would pass me by and select the next man on the eligible list and give me a call at the next vacancy, but he shut me off with, Then you don't want the position? But I do, I protested. Don't you see, if you will pass me over this time? If you want it, you will take it, he said coldly. Happily for me, the cursed brutality of the man made me angry. 
Very well, I said. I won't take it. End of chapter 25「Chapter Twenty Six Having burned my ship, I plunged into writing. I am afraid I always was an extremist. Early and late I was at it, writing, typing, studying grammar, studying, writing in all the forms of writing, and studying the writers who succeeded in order to find out how they succeeded. I managed on five hours sleep in the twenty-four, and came pretty close to working the nineteen waking hours left to me. My light burned till two and three in the morning, which led a good neighbor woman into a bit of sentimental Sherlock Holmes deduction. Never seeing me in the daytime, she concluded that I was a gambler, and that the light in my window was placed there by my mother to guide her erring son home. The trouble with the beginner at the writing game is the long dry spells, when there is never an editor's check and everything pawnable is pawned. I wore my summer suit pretty well through that winter, and the following summer experienced the longest, driest spell of all, in the period when salaried men are gone on vacation and manuscripts lie in editorial offices until vacation is over. My difficulty was that I had no one to advise me. I didn't know a soul who had written or who had ever tried to write. I didn't even know one reporter. Also, to succeed at the writing game, I found I had to unlearn about everything the teachers and professors of literature of the high school and university had taught me. I was very indignant about this at the time, though now I can understand it. They did not know the trick of successful writing in the years 1895 and 1896. They knew all about Snowbound and Sartore Sartis, but the American editors of 1899 did not want such truck. They wanted the 1899 truck, and offered to pay so well for it that the teachers and professors of literature would have quit their jobs could they have supplied it. I struggled on, stood off the butcher and the grocer, pawned my watch and bicycle and my father's Macintosh, and I worked. I really did work, and went on short commons of sleep. Critics have complained about the swift education one of my characters, Martin Eden, achieved. In three years from a sailor with a common school education, I made a successful writer of him. The critics say this is impossible. Yet I was Martin Eden. At the end of three working years, two of which were spent in high school and the university, and one spent at writing, and all three in studying immensely and intensely, I was publishing stories in magazines such as the Atlantic Monthly, was correcting proofs of my first book, issued by Houghton Mifflin Company, was selling sociological articles to Cosmopolitan and McClure's, had declined an associate editorship proffered me by telegraph from New York City, and was getting ready to marry. Now the foregoing means work, especially the last year of it, when I was learning my trade as a writer. And in that year, running short on sleep and taking my brain to its limit, I neither drank nor cared to drink. So far as I was concerned, alcohol did not exist. I did suffer from brain fag on occasion, but alcohol never suggested itself as an ameliorative. Heavens! Editorial acceptances and checks 
were all the amelioratives I needed. A thin envelope from an editor in the morning's mail was more stimulating than half a dozen cocktails. And if a check of decent amount came out of the envelope, such incident in itself was a whole drunk. Furthermore, at that time in my life I did not know what a cocktail was. I remember, when my first book was published, several Alaskans who were members of the Bohemian Club entertained me one evening at the club in San Francisco. We sat in most wonderful leather chairs, and drinks were ordered. Never had I heard such an ordering of liqueurs and of highballs of particular brands of scotch. I didn't know what a liqueur or a highball was, and I didn't know that scotch meant whiskey. I knew only poor men's drinks, the drinks of the frontier and of sailor town, cheap beer and cheaper whiskey that was just called whiskey and nothing else. I was embarrassed to make a choice, and the steward nearly collapsed when I ordered claret as an after-dinner drink. Chapter 27 As I succeeded with my writing, my standard of living rose and my horizon broadened. I confined myself to writing and typing a thousand words a day, including Sundays and holidays. And I still studied hard, but not so hard as formerly. I allowed myself five and one hours of actual sleep. I added this half hour because I was compelled. Financial success permitted me more time for exercise. I rode my wheel more, chiefly because it was permanently out of pawn, and I boxed and fenced, walked on my hands, jumped high and broad, put the shot and tossed the caber, and went swimming. And I learned that more sleep is required for physical exercise than for mental exercise. There were tired nights bodily when I slept six hours and on occasion of very severe exercise I actually slept seven hours. But such sleep orgies were not frequent. There was so much to learn, so much to be done, that I felt wicked when I slept seven hours. And I blessed the man who invented alarm clocks. And still no desire to drink. I possessed too many fine faiths, was living at too keen a pitch. I was a socialist, intent on saving the world, and alcohol could not give me the fervors that were mine from my ideas and ideals. My voice, on account of my successful writing, had added weight, or so I thought. At any rate, my reputation as a writer drew me audiences that my reputation as a speaker never could have drawn. I was invited before clubs and organizations of all sorts to deliver my message. I fought the good fight, and went on studying and writing, and was very busy. Up to this time I had had a very restricted circle of friends, but now I began to go about. I was invited out, especially to dinner, and I made many friends and acquaintances whose economic lives were easier than mine had been, and many of them drank. In their own houses they drank and offered me drink. They were not drunkards, any of them. They just drank temperately, and I drank temperately with them as an act of comradeship and accepted hospitality. I did not care for it, neither wanted it, nor did not want it, and so small was the impression made by it that I do not remember my first cocktail nor my first scotch highball. Well, I had a house. When one is asked into other houses, he naturally asks others into his house. Behold the rising standard of living. Having been given drink in other houses... I could expect nothing else of myself than to give drink in my own house. 
So I laid in a supply of beer and whiskey and table claret. Never since that has my house not been well equipped. And still, through all this period, I did not care in the slightest for John Barleycorn. I drank when others drank and with them as a social act. And I had so little choice in the matter that I drank whatever they drank. If they elected whiskey, then whiskey it was for me. If they drank root beer or sarsaparilla, I drank root beer or sarsaparilla with them. And when there were no friends in the house, why, I didn't drink anything. Whiskey decanters were always in the room where I wrote, and for months and years I never knew what it was when by myself to take a drink. When out at dinner, I noticed the kindly, genial glow of the preliminary cocktail. It seemed a very fitting and gracious thing. Yet so little did I stand in need of it, with my own high intensity and vitality, that I never thought it worth while to have a cocktail before my own meal when I ate alone. On the other hand, I well remember a very brilliant man, somewhat older than I, who occasionally visited me. He liked whiskey, and I recall sitting whole afternoons in my den, drinking steadily with him, drink for drink, until he was mildly lighted up, and I was slightly aware that I had drunk some whiskey. Now why did I do this? I don't know save that the old schooling held, the training of the old days and nights glass in hand with men, the drinking ways of drink and drinkers. Besides, I no longer feared John Barleycorn. Mine was that most dangerous stage when a man believes himself John Barleycorn's master. I had proved it to my satisfaction in the long years of work and study. I could drink when I wanted, refrain when I wanted, drink without getting drunk, and to cap everything, I was thoroughly conscious that I had no liking for the stuff. During this period, I drank precisely for the same reason I had drunk with Scotty and the Harpooner and with the Oyster Pirates, because it was an act that men performed with whom I wanted to behave as a man. These brilliant ones, these adventurers of the mind, drank. Very well. There was no reason I should not drink with them, I who knew so confidently that I had nothing to fear from John Barleycorn. And the foregoing was my attitude of mind for years. Occasionally I got well jingled, but such occasions were rare. It interfered with my work, and I permitted nothing to interfere with my work. I remember when spending several months in the east end of London, during which time I wrote a book, and had ventured much amongst the worst of the slum classes, that I got drunk several times, and was mightily wroth with myself, because it interfered with my writing. Yet these very times were because I was out on the adventure path where John Barleycorn is always to be found. Then, too, with the certitude of long training and unholy intimacy, there were occasions when I engaged in drinking hours with men. Of course, this was on the adventure path in various parts of the world, and it was a matter of pride. It is a queer man pride that leads one to drink with men in order to show as strong a head as they. But this queer man pride is not theory, it is fact. For instance, a wild band of young revolutionists invited me as the guest of honor to a beer bust. It is the only technical beer bust I ever attended. I did not know the true inwardness of the affair when I accepted. 
I imagined that the talk would be wild and high, that some of them might drink more than they might, and that I would drink discreetly. But it seemed these beer busts were a diversion of these high-spirited young fellows, whereby they whiled away the tedium of existence by making fools of their betters. As I learned afterward, they had got their previous guest of honor, a brilliant young radical, unskilled in drinking, quite pipped. When I found myself with them, and the situation dawned on me, up rose my queer man pride. I'd show them, the young rascals. I'd show them who was husky and chesty, who had the vitality and the constitution, the stomach and the head, who could make most of a swine of himself and show at least. These unlicked cubs who thought they could outdrink me. You see, it was an endurance test, and no man likes to give another best. Faugh! It was steam beer. I had learned more expensive brews. Not for years had I drunk steam beer, but when I had, I had drunk with men, and I guessed I could show these youngsters some ability in beer guzzling. And the drinking began, and I had to drink with the best of them. Some of them might lag, but the guest of honor was not permitted to lag and all my austere nights of midnight oil, all the books I had read, all the wisdom I had gathered, went glimmering before the ape and tiger in me that crawled up from the abysm of my heredity, atavistic, competitive, and brutal, lustful with strength and desire to outswine the swine and when the session broke up, I was still on my feet, and I walked, erect, unswaying, which was more than can be said of some of my hosts. I recall one of them in indignant tears on the street corner, weeping as he pointed out my sober condition. Little he dreamed the iron clutch, born of old training, with which I held to my consciousness in my swimming brain, kept control of my muscles and my qualms, kept my voice unbroken and easy, and my thoughts consecutive and logical. Yes, and mixed up with it all, I was privily a grin. They hadn't made a fool of me in that drinking bout and I was proud of myself for the achievement. Darn it, I am still proud, so strangely is man compounded. But I didn't write my thousand words next morning. I was sick, poisoned. It was a day of wretchedness. In the afternoon, I had to give a public speech. I gave it, and I am confident it was as bad as I felt. Some of my hosts were there in the front rows to mark any signs on me of the night before. I don't know what signs they marked, but I marked signs on them and took consolation in the knowledge that they were just as sick as I. Never again, I swore, and I have never been inveigled into another beer bust. For that matter, that was my last drinking bout of any sort. Oh, I have drunk ever since, but with more wisdom, more discretion, and never in a competitive spirit. It is thus that the seasoned drinker grows seasoned. To show that at this period in my life drinking was wholly a matter of companionship, I remember crossing the Atlantic in the old Teutonic. It chanced at the start that I chummed with an English cable operator and a younger member of a Spanish shipping firm. Now the only thing they drank was horse's neck, 
a long soft cool drink with an apple peel or an orange peel floating in it and for that whole voyage i drank horses necks with my two companions on the other hand had they drunk whiskey i should have drunk whiskey with them from this it must not be concluded that i was merely weak i didn't care i had no morality in the matter i was strong with youth and unafraid and alcohol was an utterly negligible question as far as i was concerned chapter twenty eight not yet was i ready to tuck my arms in john barleycorn's the older i got the greater my success the more money i earned the wider was the command of the world that became mine and the more prominently did john barleycorn bulk in my life and still i maintained no more than a nodding acquaintance with him i drank for the sake of sociability and when alone i did not drink sometimes i got jingled but i considered such jingles the mild price i paid for sociability to show how unripe i was for john barleycorn when at this time i descended into my slough of despond i never dreamed of turning to john barleycorn for a helping hand i had life troubles and heart troubles which are neither here nor there in this narrative but combined with them were intellectual troubles which are indeed germane mine was no uncommon experience i had read too much positive science and lived too much positive life in the eagerness of youth i had made the ancient mistake of pursuing truth too relentlessly i had torn her veils from her and the sight was too terrible for me to stand in brief i lost my fine faiths in pretty well everything except humanity and the humanity i retained faith in was a very stark humanity indeed this long sickness of pessimism is too well known to most of us to be detailed here let it suffice to state that i had it very bad i meditated suicide coolly as a greek philosopher might my regret was that there were too many dependent directly upon me for food and shelter for me to quit living but that was sheer morality what really saved me was the one remaining illusion the people the things i had fought for and burned my midnight oil for had failed me success i despised it recognition it was dead ashes society men and women above the ruck and muck of the waterfront and the forecastle i was appalled by their unlovely mental mediocrity love of woman it was like all the rest money i could sleep in only one bed at a time and of what worth was an income of a hundred porterhouses a day when i could eat only one art culture in the face of the iron facts of biology such things were ridiculous the exponents of such things only the more ridiculous from the foregoing it can be seen how very sick i was i was born a fighter the things i had fought for had proved not worth the fight remained the people my fight was finished yet something was left still to fight for the people but while i was discovering this one last tie to bind me to life in my extremity in the depths of despond walking in the valley of the shadow my ears were deaf to john barleycorn 
never the remotest whisper arose in my consciousness that john barleycorn was the anodyne that he could lie me along to live one way only was uppermost in my thought my revolver the crashing eternal darkness of a bullet there was plenty of whiskey in the house for my guests i never touched it i grew afraid of my revolver afraid during the period in which the radiant flashing vision of the people was forming in my mind and will so obsessed was i with the desire to die that i feared i might commit the act in my sleep and i was compelled to give my revolver away to others who were to lose it for me where my subconscious hand might not find it but the people saved me by the people was i handcuffed to life there was still one fight left in me and here was the thing for which to fight i threw all precaution to the winds threw myself with fiercer zeal into the fight for socialism laughed at the editors and publishers who warned me and who were the sources of my hundred porterhouses a day and was brutally careless of whose feelings i hurt and of how savagely i hurt them as the well-balanced radicals charged at the time my efforts were so strenuous so unsafe and unsane so ultra-revolutionary that i retarded the socialist development in the united states by five years in passing i wish to remark at this late date that it is my fond belief that i accelerated the socialist development in the united states by at least five minutes it was the people and no thanks to john barleycorn who pulled me through my long sickness and when i was convalescent came the love of woman to complete the cure and lull my pessimism asleep for many a long day until john barleycorn again awoke it but in the meantime i pursued truth less relentlessly refraining from tearing her last veils aside even when i clutched them in my hand i no longer cared to look upon truth naked i refused to permit myself to see a second time what i had once seen and the memory of what i had that time seen i resolutely blotted from my mind and i was very happy life went well with me i took delight in little things the big things i declined to take too seriously i still read the books but not with the old eagerness i still read the books to-day but never again shall i read them with that old glory of youthful passion when i hacked to the call from over and beyond that whispered me on to win to the mystery at the back of life and behind the stars the point of this chapter is that in the long sickness that at some time comes to most of us i came through without any appeal for aid to john barleycorn love socialism the people healthy figments of man's mind were the things that cured and saved me if ever a man was not a born alcoholic i believe that i am that man and yet well let the succeeding chapters tell their tale for in them will be shown how i paid for my previous quarter of a century of contact with ever accessible john barleycorn end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine after my long sickness my drinking continued to be convivial 
I drank when others drank, and I was with them. But imperceptibly, my need for alcohol took form and began to grow. It was not a body need. I boxed, swam, sailed, rode horses, lived in the open and errantly healthful life, and passed life insurance examinations with flying colors. In its inception, now that I look back upon it, this need for alcohol was a mental need, a nerve need, a good spirits need. How can I explain? It was something like this. Physiologically, from the standpoint of palate and stomach, alcohol was, as it had always been, repulsive. It tasted no better than beer did when I was five, than bitter claret did when I was seven. When I was alone, writing or studying, I had no need for it. But I was growing old or wise or both or senile as an alternative. When I was in company, I was less pleased, less excited with the things said and done. Erstwhile, worthwhile fun and stunts seemed no longer worthwhile and it was a torment to listen to the insipidities and stupidities of women to the pompous arrogant sayings of the little half-baked men it is the penalty one pays for reading the books too much or for being oneself a fool in my case it does not matter which was my trouble the trouble itself was the fact. The condition of the fact was mine. For me, the life and light and sparkle of human intercourse were dwindling. I had climbed too high among the stars, or maybe I had slept too hard. Yet I was not hysterical, nor in any way overwrought. My pulse was normal. My heart was an amazement of excellence to the insurance doctors. My lungs threw the said doctors into ecstasies. I wrote a thousand words every day. I was punctiliously exact in dealing with all the affairs of life that fell to my lot. I exercised in joy and gladness. I slept at night like a babe. But... Well, as soon as I got out in the company of others, I was driven to melancholy and spiritual tears. I could neither laugh with nor at the solemn utterances of men I esteemed ponderous asses, nor could I laugh nor engage in my old-time lightsome persiflage with the silly superficial chatterings of women who underneath all their silliness and softness were as primitive, direct, and deadly in their pursuit of biological destiny as the monkeys women were before they shed their furry coats and replaced them with the furs of other animals. And I was not pessimistic. I swear I was not pessimistic. I was merely bored. I had seen the same show too often, listened too often to the same songs and the same jokes. I knew too much about the box office receipts. I knew the cogs of the machinery behind the scenes so well that the posing on the stage and the laughter and the song could not drown the creaking of the wheels behind. It doesn't pay to go behind the scenes and see the angel-voiced tenor beat his wife. Well, I'd been behind, and I was paying for it. Or else I was a fool. It is immaterial which was my situation. The situation is what counts, and the situation was that social intercourse for me was getting painful and difficult. On the other hand, it must be stated that on rare occasions, on very rare occasions, I did meet rare souls, or fools like me, 
with whom i could spend magnificent hours among the stars or in the paradise of fools i was married to a rare soul or a fool who never bored me and who was always a source of new and unending surprise and delight but i could not spend all my hours solely in her company nor would it have been fair nor wise to compel her to spend all her hours in my company besides i had written a string of successful books and society demands some portion of the recreative hours of a fellow that writes books and any normal man of himself and his needs demands some hours of his fellow men and now we begin to come to it how to face the social intercourse game with the glamour gone john barleycorn the ever patient one had waited a quarter of a century and more for me to reach my hand out in need of him his thousand tricks had failed thanks to my constitution and good luck but he had more tricks in his bag a cocktail or two or several i found cheered me up for the foolishness of foolish people a cocktail or several before dinner enabled me to laugh wholeheartedly at things which had long since ceased being laughable the cocktail was a prod a spur a kick to my jaded mind and bored spirits it recrudesced the laughter and the song and put a lilt into my own imagination so that i could laugh and sing and say foolish things with the liveliest of them or platitudes with verve and intensity to the satisfaction of the pompous mediocre ones who knew no other way to talk a poor companion without a cocktail i became a very good companion with one i achieved a false exhilaration drugged myself to merriment and the thing began so imperceptibly that i old intimate of john barleycorn never dreamed whither it was leading me i was beginning to call for music and wine soon i should be calling for madder music and more wine it was at this time i became aware of waiting with expectancy for the pre-dinner cocktail i wanted it and i was conscious that i wanted it i remember while war corresponding in the far east of being irresistibly attracted to a certain home besides accepting all invitations to dinner i made a point of dropping in almost every afternoon now the hostess was a charming woman but it was not for her sake that i was under her roof so frequently it happened that she made by far the finest cocktail procurable in that large city where drink mixing on the part of the foreign population was indeed an art up at the club down at the hotels and in other private houses no such cocktails were created her cocktails were subtle they were masterpieces they were the least repulsive to the palate and carried the most kick and yet i desired her cocktails only for sociability's sake to key myself to sociable moods when i rode away from that city across hundreds of miles of rice fields and mountains and through months of campaigning and on with the victorious japanese into manchuria i did not drink several bottles of whiskey were always to be found on the backs of my pack horses yet i never broached a bottle for myself never took a drink by myself and never knew a desire to take such a drink oh if a white man came into my camp 
I opened a bottle, and we drank together according to the way of men, just as he would open a bottle and drink with me if I came into his camp. I carried that whiskey for social purposes, and I so charged it up to my expense account to the newspaper for which I worked. Only in retrospect can I mark the almost imperceptible growth of my desire. There were little hints then that I did not take, little straws in the wind that I did not see, little incidents the gravity of which I did not realize. For instance, for some years it had been my practice each winter to cruise for six or eight weeks on San Francisco Bay. My stout sloop yacht, the Spray, had a comfortable cabin and a coal stove. A Korean boy did the cooking, and I usually took a friend or so along to share the joys of the cruise. Also, I took my machine along and did my thousand words a day. On the particular trip I have in mind, Cloudsley and Toddy came along. This was Toddy's first trip. On previous trips, Cloudsley had elected to drink beer, so I had kept the yacht supplied with beer and had drunk beer with him. But on this cruise, the situation was different. Toddy was so nicknamed because of his diabolical cleverness in concocting toddies. So I brought whiskey along, a couple of gallons. Alas, many another gallon I bought, for Cloudsley and I got into the habit of drinking a certain hot toddy that actually tasted delicious going down and that carried the most exhilarating kick imaginable. I liked those toddies. I grew to look forward to the making of them. We drank them regularly, one before breakfast, one before dinner, one before supper, and a final one when we went to bed. We never got drunk but I will say that four times a day we were very genial. And when, in the middle of the cruise, Toddy was called back to San Francisco on business, Cloudsley and I saw to it that the Korean boy mixed Toddy's regularly for us according to formula. But that was only on the boat. Back on the land, in my house, I took no breakfast eye-opener, no bed-going nightcap, and I haven't drunk hot toddies since, and that was many a year ago. But the point is, I liked those toddies. The geniality of which they were provocative was marvelous. They were eloquent proselytes for John Barleycorn in their own small, insidious way. They were tickles of the something destined to grow into daily and deadly desire. And I didn't know, never dreamed, I, who had lived with John Barleycorn for so many years, and laughed at all his unavailing attempts to win me. Chapter 30 Part of the process of recovering from my long sickness was to find delight in little things, in things unconnected with books and problems, in play, in games of tag in the swimming pool, in flying kites, in fooling with horses, in working out mechanical puzzles. As a result, I grew tired of the city. On the ranch, in the valley of the moon, I found my paradise. I gave up living in cities. All the cities held for me were music, the theater, and Turkish baths. And all went well with me. I worked hard, played hard, and was very happy. 
I read more fiction and less fact. I did not study a tithe as much as I had studied in the past. I still took an interest in the fundamental problems of existence, but it was a very cautious interest, for I had burned my fingers that time I clutched at the veils of truth and wrestled them from her. There was a bit of lie in this attitude of mine, a bit of hypocrisy, but the lie and the hypocrisy were those of a man desiring to live. I deliberately blinded myself to what I took to be the savage interpretation of biological fact. After all, I was merely forswearing a bad habit, foregoing a bad frame of mind. And I repeat, I was very happy. And, I add, that in all my days, measuring them with cold, considerative judgment, this was, far and away beyond all other periods, the happiest period of my life. But the time was at hand, rhymeless and reasonless, so far as I can see, when I was to begin to pay for my score of years of dallying with John Barleycorn. Occasionally, guests journeyed to the ranch, and remained a few days. Some did not drink. But to those who did drink, the absence of all alcohol on the ranch was a hardship. I could not violate my sense of hospitality by compelling them to endure this hardship. I ordered in a stock for my guests. I was never interested enough in cocktails to know how they were made. So I got a barkeeper in Oakland to make them in bulk and ship them to me. When I had no guests, I didn't drink. But I began to notice, when I finished my morning's work, that I was glad if there was a guest, for then I could drink a cocktail with him. Now I was so clean of alcohol that even a single cocktail was provocative of pitch. A single cocktail would glow the mind and tickle a laugh for the few minutes prior to sitting down to table and starting the delightful process of eating. On the other hand, such was the strength of my stomach, of my alcoholic resistance, that the single cocktail was only the glimmer of a glow, the faintest tickle of a laugh. One day, a friend frankly and shamelessly suggested a second cocktail. I drank the second with him. The glow was appreciably longer and warmer, the laughter deeper and more resonant. One does not forget such experiences. Sometime I almost think that it was because I was so very happy that I started on my real drinking. I remember one day Charmian and I took a long ride over the mountains on our horses. The servants had been dismissed for the day, and we returned late at night to a jolly, chafing dish supper oh it was good to be alive that night while the supper was preparing the two of us alone in the kitchen i personally was at the top of life such things as the books and ultimate truth did not exist my body was gloriously healthy and healthily tired from the long ride it had been a splendid day. The night was splendid. I was with the woman who was my mate, picnicking in gleeful abandon. I had no troubles. The bills were all paid, and a surplus of money was rolling in on me. The future ever widened before me. And right there, in the kitchen, delicious things bubbled in the chafing dish 
our laughter bubbled, and my stomach was keen with a most delicious edge of appetite. I felt so good that somehow, somewhere, in me arose an insatiable greed to feel better. I was so happy that I wanted to pitch my happiness even higher, and I knew the way. Ten thousand contacts with John Barleycorn had taught me. Several times I wandered out of the kitchen to the cocktail bottle, and each time I left it diminished by one man's size cocktail. The result was splendid. I wasn't jingled, I wasn't lighted up, but I was warmed. I glowed. My happiness was pyramided. Munificent as life was to me, I added to that munificence. It was a great hour, one of my greatest. But I paid for it long afterwards, as you will see. One does not forget such experiences, and in human stupidity cannot be brought to realize that there is no immutable law which decrees that same things shall produce same results. For they don't. Else would the thousandth pipe of opium be provocative of similar delights to the first else would one cocktail instead of several produce an equivalent glow after a year of cocktails one day just before i ate midday dinner after my morning's writing was done when i had no guest i took a cocktail by myself thereafter when there were no guests I took this daily pre-dinner cocktail. And right there, John Barleycorn had me. I was beginning to drink regularly. I was beginning to drink alone. And I was beginning to drink not for hospitality's sake, not for the sake of the taste, but for the effect of the drink. I wanted that daily pre-dinner cocktail, and it never crossed my mind that there was any reason I should not have it. I paid for it. I could pay for a thousand cocktails each day if I wanted. And what was a cocktail? One cocktail. To me, who had on so many occasions, for so many years, had drunk inordinate quantities of stiffer stuff and been unharmed. The program of my ranch life was as follows. Each morning at 8.30, having been reading or correcting proofs in bed since 4 or 5, I went to my desk. Odds and ends of correspondence and notes occupied me till 9, and at 9 sharp, invariably i began my writing by eleven sometimes a few minutes earlier or later my thousand words were finished another half hour at cleaning up my desk and my day's work was done so that eleven thirty i got into a hammock under the trees with my mail bag and the morning newspaper at twelve thirty i ate dinner and in the afternoon I swam and rowed. One morning, at eleven-thirty, before I got into the hammock, I took a cocktail. I repeated this on subsequent mornings, of course, taking another cocktail just before I ate at twelve-thirty. Soon I found myself seated at my desk in the midst of my thousand words, looking forward to that 11.30 cocktail. At last, now I was thoroughly conscious that I desired alcohol. But what of it? 
I wasn't afraid of John Barleycorn. I had associated with him too long. I was wise in the matter of drink. I was discreet. Never again would I drink to excess. I knew the dangers and the pitfalls of John Barleycorn, the various ways by which he had tried to kill me in the past. But all that was past, long past. Never again would I drink myself to stupefaction. Never again would I get drunk. All I wanted and all I would take was just enough to glow and warm me, to kick geniality alive in me and put laughter in my throat and stir the maggots of imagination slightly in my brain. Oh, I was thoroughly master of myself and of John Barleycorn. End of chapter 30